when one rejects basic biblical morality, then it doesn't take long to develop a philosophy of murder. It didn't take Nietzsche long at all. Welcome to the Monty Collier Report. I'm Monty Collier. If you'd like to have a free copy of my theological journal, then send me an email to the email address you see at the beginning of this video, and I'll send one out to you free of charge. After World War II, people were shocked to learn how the Nazis had a systematic method for murdering the handicapped, the retarded, and those too sick to contribute to National Socialism. This philosophy of murder is still shocking to those of us with a Calvinist worldview today. How could a group of people, or even a single individual for that matter, ever come to approve of such horrific behavior? The Bible answers this question. Scripture tells us that fallen man is totally depraved. Quote, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. End quote. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. The philosophy of murder proceeds from the mind of one who is desperately wicked. To be sure, the Nazis were not the first to practice the philosophy of murder. The Bible gives us Pharaoh, Exodus chapter 1, verse 15, and Herod, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 18, as two primitive examples. The Roman Catholic Church state also teaches a philosophy of murder, and though it cannot practice this philosophy publicly at this moment, it patiently waits for the moment when it can once again unleash the terror known as the Holy Roman Catholic Inquisition. Millions were murdered by this Roman Catholic institution. The official Catholic philosophy of murder is found in the writings of Thomas Aquinas. In his Summa Theologica, Aquinas writes, and I quote, With regard to heretics, two points must be observed. One, on their own side, the other, on the side of the church. On their own side, there is the sin, whereby they deserve not only to be separated from the church by excommunication, but also to be severed from the world by death. For it is a much greater matter to corrupt the faith which quickens the soul than to forge money, which supports temporal life. Wherefore, if forgers of money and other evil doers are forthwith condemned to death by the secular authority, much more reason is there for heretics, as soon as they are convicted of heresy, to be not only excommunicated, but even put to death. On the part of the church, however, there is mercy which looks to the conversion of the wanderer, wherefore she condemns not at once, but after the first and second admonition, as the apostle directs. After that, if he is yet stubborn, the church, no longer hoping for his conversion, looks to the salvation of others, by excommunicating him and by separating him from the church, and furthermore delivers him to the secular tribunal to be exterminated, thereby from the world, by death. End quote. Summa Theologica, Volume 3, Part 11, Question 11, Article 3, page 1220. Like the Roman Catholic philosopher Thomas Aquinas, Friedrich Nietzsche also had a wicked philosophy of murder to eliminate those unwanted persons who might be standing in the way. Unlike Thomas Aquinas, Nietzsche didn't lie by claiming his philosophy of murder was sanctioned by Christianity. The atheist madman boldly writes, and I quote, The sick are parasites of society. In certain conditions, it is improper to live any longer. The continued vegetating and cowardly dependence on physicians and prescriptions after the meaning of life, the right to life, has been lost, should entail the profound contempt of society. To create a new responsibility, the physician's responsibility, for all cases where the highest interest of life, of ascending life, requires the remorseless crushing down and thrusting aside of degenerating life. Twilight of the Idols Roving Expeditions of an Inopportune Philosopher, section 36, page 56. When society with profound contempt comes to see the sick as parasites who have lost the right to life, then it will not be long before measures are taken to kill such pests. Nietzsche died in 1900, but similar arguments surfaced in Nazi Germany just decades later. By that time, the major Protestant churches of Germany were apostate, 
and some even joined the Catholics in helping the Nazis. Indeed, Hitler himself seems to have taken the advice of Friedrich Nietzsche, for the German dictator committed suicide when he realized he had no more chance of succeeding. Nietzsche's morbid advice is as follows, and I quote, To die proudly when it is no longer possible to live proudly. Death selected voluntarily, death at the right time. Out of love to life, we should desire a different kind of death. Voluntarily, conscious, not accidental or by surprise. When someone does away with himself, he does the noblest thing in the world. End quote. Twilight of the Idols, Roving Expeditions of an Inopportune Philosopher, section 36, pages 56 through 57. Notice how the sin of pride permeates this twisted notion of self-murder. The wicked resist God even in their death. Furthermore, Nietzsche never explains how one can know when it is the right time to commit suicide. But since scripture, not to mention history, teaches us that a man can die by accident or by surprise at any moment, then it seems only logical that the serious follower of Nietzsche should immediately murder himself, lest death take him by surprise. The Bible condemns suicide as a violation of the Sixth Commandment. See Exodus chapter 20 verse 13. Life and death belong to God alone, and to willfully take one's own life is to blasphemously play the part of God. The Bible says, and I quote, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. End quote. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 6. Paul gives us a simple command in the New Testament when he witnesses a jailer about to commit suicide. Quote, but Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm. End quote. Romans chapter 16 verse 28. The Westminster Larger Catechism discusses the command, Thou shalt not murder, in question 136 of that catechism. Question 136 asks, What are the sins forbidden in the Sixth Commandment? The answer is, The sins forbidden in the Sixth Commandment are, All taking away the life of ourselves or of others. Now the converse of the Sixth Commandment is that we try our best to lawfully preserve our own lives and the lives of other persons. The Bible says, and I quote, And it came to pass, also on another Sabbath, that Jesus entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts, and said to the man, which had the withered hand, Rise up, and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then Jesus said unto him, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other.